want to welcome you once again to the Upper Room. Right off the bat, we're going to do a discussion question, and this is one of those that you either kind of know it or you don't, and I'm going to tell you right up front, please don't use your phones. It'll be tempting because you can find the answer. There is an answer to this, and the question is, you can discuss it amongst yourselves, who was Edward Everett, and what was he famous for? All right, go for it. Well, you may know what he was famous for, but let me give you a little background on who he was. He grew up in a uh, home of a pastor, and he became a pastor, but then he moved into other circles, and he became uh, the governor of a state. He became a secretary of state for the nation. He was the president of Harvard for a time. I mean, you talk about an accomplished man, Edward Everett was certainly that, and he was best known as an incredible orator. At least that's what they called him in those days. He was a great speaker. I mean, everybody admired what a great speaker he was. So you put all that together and you realize that Edward Everett really had a lot going for him, and it was pretty common for him to be in the public eye and to be the center of attention. You might think that all of those accomplishments and others that I didn't mention would be fodder enough for fame, but what he's really famous for is what happened on November 19th, 1863. Now you're with me, aren't you? He was the premier speaker at the dedication of the Gettysburg Cemetery, all right? And he put together a speech that was unbelievable. It had so many beautiful words and it was compelling and as to why it was important to have this cemetery because the Battle of Gettysburg was probably the greatest battle of the Civil War. Uh, it's believed that the Civil War turned on the Battle of Gettysburg. More men died there. And so it's November, it's fall. Christy and Ty and myself many years ago went to Gettysburg in the fall and I gotta tell you, it is beautiful. The, the colors have turned and it's just usually the temperature is just perfect. So it's one of those kinds of days and he is the premier speaker for this dedication. And he put so much work into this speech that it lasted, are you ready? Two hours. A two hour long speech. And to boot, he memorized it. He didn't read it off of a script. So Mr. Everett was the premier speaker at the Gettysburg Cemetery dedication. And another guy showed up, but they didn't know if he would show up for sure. You know who the other guy is. Think about the setting. It was Abraham Lincoln. And so you think about all the preparation that Mr. Everett went to to provide this incredible speech that nobody would ever, ever forget two hours worth and then President Lincoln shows up and on the way to Gettysburg he had scribbled a couple notes on a notepad and that's what he used. He got up after Mr. Everett. Now if you were there that day I want you to imagine what that would have been like. Two hours of this guy and you're spellbound. I mean you're thinking this guy's incredible. Uh, he keeps your attention for two hours and then all of a sudden he sits down, everybody applauds, and from the back comes six foot four, lanky, aged looking, even though he was only in his 50s, Abraham Lincoln. And you think, oh man, you know, I need to, maybe your buddy says, I'm hungry, I'm gonna go get a hot dog, you want a hot dog? Well, okay, make it quick, but you know, if, if that guy went two hours, then the president may go three, so you got some time. So your buddy gets back from getting a hot dog for both of you, and he says, where's the president? He says, he's done. He's done? Two minutes is the length of the speech from President Lincoln at Gettysburg. <laughs> two minutes. Two hours by the professional, two minutes by mm, just the leader of the United States of America at the most precarious time in the nation's history a two-minute talk. 
I love what he did there. And I want to read to you just a, a line from Abraham Lincoln's speech. And it goes like this. The world will little note or long remember what we say here. Don't miss that. In other words, what we're saying here is no big deal. It really isn't. We will not be famous because of what we said. It's not the most important thing about this whole event. The world will little note or long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. Today we call that a mic drop because he walked off the stage. He walked off the stage. A mic drop. A show stopper. That stops the show right there. Just two minutes. I love that about President Lincoln and what he said there. And what's ironic is that, guess what? We all remember the Gettysburg Address. He didn't think anybody would because he didn't think that highly of himself. And again, I don't want to disparage Mr. Everett, but the work he put into it in a two-hour speech, you know, I'm pretty sure everybody's going to remember what I say and how important it was and how beautiful it was. What's going on there? There's a difference between putting on a show and humbly stepping aside and saying, I defer to, and in Lincoln's case, I defer to the men who bled on this ground and made this hallowed ground and may the world always remember their sacrifice. That's a showstopper right there. That's all that anybody now will remember. Abraham Lincoln was quite the showstopper, but he wasn't the first showstopper and he wasn't the most important showstopper. For that, we turn back to Matthew chapter six, verse one. I hope you're there. We're in this series called The Lucky Ones, The Sermon on the Mount. And today we're only gonna cover one verse. And so I think you're probably thinking, oh good, this will be two minutes. Sorry, I'm not Abraham Lincoln. I think I'm so important that I'm gonna talk for more than two minutes. No, I don't. I just think what Jesus said is even more important by far than what President Lincoln said that day. Here we go, Matthew 6, 1. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. There's an old story about a holy man in the East who would sit on the corner of a busy street and as tourists came by, they would stop and ask if they could take pictures of him. And he covered himself in ashes to make himself appear destitute and humble. Ironically though, when someone would stop and ask to take a picture, he would oblige them, but then he'd rearrange the ashes and pour more on in different places so it was more impressive. <laughs> And I've heard it said that that is a great picture of modern Christianity. That modern Christianity is like this religious man constantly propping himself up in order to appear humble and destitute and certainly devoted to his cause. The reality is modern Christianity is much like that, but there is little humility and the devotion is often to self, not to God. So what do we have here? We have Jesus shining a bright and annoying light on the Jewish leaders. That's really what he's doing. And it is, as you might have guessed, about hypocrisy. Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Now think about that. People actually teaching what they're learning from demons such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. So Paul predicts that in the later days, and certainly I think we all can agree we're there, we're in the later days, that it is hypocritical liars, people who pretend to be one thing and are yet another and they're lying to us. And that's kind of permeating a lot of faith circles and large, faith bodies, I believe. What did God think of this idea of hypocrisy? He had a lot to say about it. Let me give you a couple passages right off the bat. Amos chapter 5 verse 21, the prophet says this on behalf of God, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. 
but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. Discussion question number two. What do you think has prompted this from God? Okay, the Lord wasn't done with his fury over hypocrisy. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 11 reads this way. Why this frenzy of sacrifices, God's asking? Don't you think I've had my fill of burnt sacrifices, rams, and plump grain-fed calves? Don't you think I've had my fill of blood from bulls, lambs, and goats? When you come before me, whoever gave you the idea of acting like this, running here and there, doing this and that, all this sheer commotion in the place provided for worship. Quit your worship charades. I can't stand your trivial religious games. Monthly conferences, weekly Sabbath, special meetings, 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 meetings. I can't stand one more, God says. Meetings for this, meetings for that. I hate them. You've worn me out. I'm sick of your religion, religion, religion while you go right on sinning. When you put on your next prayer performance, I'll be looking the other way. No matter how long or loud or often you pray, I'll not be listening. And do you know why? Because you've been tearing people to pieces and your hands are bloody. Go home, wash up, clean up your act. Sweep your lives clean of your evil doing so I don't have to look at them any longer. Say no to wrong, learn to do good. <laughs> How's that for a scathing review of performance by the Jewish people. You ever wonder if God might be saying the same thing to us? In 1986, Whitney Houston, who had unsurpassed talent and beauty, recorded a song that became a top hit. And the song's title was The Greatest Love of All. Now, Whitney Houston, throughout her life many times, uh, proposed that she was a strong follower of Jesus, that she was a Christian. She grew up in the church. So you can imagine a song entitled The Greatest Love of All is going to be about the love of God, the love of Jesus, right? And not so much. The song has a phrase in it and it goes like this. Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. Oh, not the love of Jesus. Loving myself is the greatest love of all. <laughs> She's a product of our culture. We are products of our culture because we hear that all the time, don't we? You got to start with loving yourself. Yeah, that's Whitney Houston's version of it. No, love for God is something that surpasses anything else in this life. The love of God surpasses all things. And so the big question becomes, if I'm going to buy that line from the culture, how do I live so that I can love myself in a supreme way and yet appear to be living for God? Did you get that question? I think that's the predominant question for most Christians today. How shall I live in order that I feel loved all the time and feel good about myself while still trying to pretend to be living for God at the same time. Let's go back one more time. We'll return to this one verse many times, Matthew 6, 1. Be especially careful, Jesus says, when you're trying to be good so that you don't make a performance out of it. It might be good theater, but the God who made you won't be applauding. Isn't that a great line? I love that translation of it. It may be great theater, but God is not applauding. When you pretend to live for God, but in fact it's all about loving yourself, that's great theater, but God is simply not applauding. Now let's unpack a couple of those words or phrases. First one is be especially careful. That's the word prosheko, and it means to take hold. So Jesus begins chapter 6 verse 1 by saying, Take hold of this idea. Don't let it go. Very important. Today, please take hold of this one idea as Jesus commands. And then he goes on to say, Don't live to be noticed by others. That phrase, to be noticed, is one Greek word. And it's the word theoumai. And it is the word from which we get theater. Isn't that amazing? He says, don't be 
living your life like you're in the theater, like you're putting on a show. Don't be doing that. It is so challenging for us to not live that life of duplicity, isn't it? To be in love with ourselves, to adore ourselves, to want to be the center of attention, and yet at least try to come across as though we're living for God. It just becomes so natural for us. Jesus here is not addressing a what, but a why. All right, it's not so much what you're doing. He says, it's your why behind what you do. And Jesus will go on in chapter six to give three illustrations of this. We just came out of six real life scenarios that Jesus gives us. It's so practical that he'll move on to three illustrations of not just what you do, but why are you doing that? That's what kingdom people ask. The why is just as important as the what. And so I want to remind you how difficult this has become for us to not think so highly of ourselves. In 1951, studies show that 12% of Americans considered themselves to be very important people. Did you get that? So in the 50s, 12%, just over 10%, just over one in 10 people in America said, I'm a really important person. In 1989, so we're still talking 30 years ago, right? In 1989, that number had grown to 80%. <laughs> what do you think it is today? I'm thinking it's probably around 90% today of those of us who consider ourselves very important because that's the, what our culture teaches us to do. And yet Jesus' message is just the opposite, isn't it? It's not about how important you are. It's about how important God is in and through your life. So chapter 6, verse 1 is really casting a light on some people, some Jewish leaders, who are setting the trend of living a duplicitous life. You know, living a life where we're at least making you think we're living for God, but we're really living for ourselves. And he does it in a real quick shot fashion. I'll take you to Matthew chapter 23 where he goes more in detail. Watch this, verse 5. Everything they, the religious leaders, everything they do is for show. Isn't that a revealing statement about these people? These are the celebrities. These are the popular. These are the powerful people of their society. He says everything they do is for show. He goes on. On their arms, they wear extra wide prayer boxes with scripture verses inside. And they wear robes with extra long tassels. For those of you that think how we dress on a Sunday is really important. Where does that idea come from? There it is. And verse six says, and they love to sit at the head table at banquets and in the seats of honor in the synagogues. They love to receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi. They love the titles, they love the positions, they love the notoriety. He says, it's all a show. Jesus doesn't back down from what he says in the Sermon on the Mount, he expounds on it. Could that be true of any of us, that we love the attention, we love to be seen, to be known, to be appreciated, to be loved? It's a dangerous place. We're calling this today the show. And you can imagine the title of this message, The Show Stopper, is about Jesus. He has come to stop the show that was going on. He had grown up watching from the time he was young and he was disgusted by it, as was his father when he spoke through Amos and spoke through Isaiah and many other times. So this is the show, which brings us to our location. We're at the Canyon View Regal Cinemas in Grand Junction. Great place if you want to come watch a movie. A lot of movies to choose from. There's actually another place called The Picture Show that's my favorite because they have recliners. Have you been to these places now? They have recliners? <laughs> but this is a great place if you want to watch movies. But what are we really talking about when we talk about going to a show? We're talking about focusing on people who are pretending to be something they're not. All right, and they get paid millions of dollars to do that. Let me take you back one more time to Matthew 6 verse 1, now from the message. Be especially careful when you're trying to be good so that you don't make a performance out of it. It might be good theater, but the God who made you won't be applauding. The people who appear on these screens that we pay way too much money to see, why do they do what they do? I don't mean to disparage them, but truly, it really is a lifestyle about pride and fame and fortune. It really is. If they got paid little or no money to do this, do you think they would be doing it 
I don't know, especially those today, maybe back in the early days they did it for the love of it, but now it's truly about pride, fame, and fortune. So I want to use the example of those who appear on the screens in the theaters uh, near you that are like this as examples of people who have professionally come to the place where they can pretend to be something they're not. And not just do it, but be good at it, and good enough to become millionaires, many of them, multi-millionaires. Not only that, they love the power that's brought to them. And how powerful is it? George Putman was an actor and a writer. He put it this way, movies are powerful, good or bad. They tinker around inside your brain. They steal upon you in the darkness of the cinema to form or conform social attitudes. In short, the story says, the cinema is propaganda. See, we say, no, it's just entertainment. The people doing it, no, it's propaganda. The famous George Lucas from Star Wars fame and many, many other films, uh, he actually has had four of the top ten grossing films of all time. He puts it this way, Film and visual entertainment are a persuasively important part of our culture. For better or for worse, the influence of the church, which used to be all-powerful, has been usurped by film. Film and television tell us the way we conduct our lives, what is right and what is wrong. How's that for power? And then my distant cousin Tom Hanks put it this way. The film industry can capture an idea and make it glamorous and gorgeous so that the audience isn't even aware that they're embracing something they never would have embraced before. Discussion question based off of that quote and the two before it. Can you give any specific examples of how we have embraced things that we wouldn't have before because of the power of the film or TV industry? Have you ever wondered what kind of a impact it has on people who have a lifestyle of pretending to be somebody they're not? Uh, I, I want to take a couple quotes, one from Heath Ledger, the late Heath Ledger, uh, who died by his own hand, I believe, and he once said, I want to pull myself apart and dissect it, meaning his performance. I go through the process of hating it, hating myself, thinking I fooled them. I can't actually do this. Thinking I fooled them. Isn't that the picture of what we're talking about here? Isn't that the picture of what Jesus is saying? Do you really think you can fool everybody? And maybe you can. Actress Troyan Belisario says this, Honestly, it's an ongoing struggle, especially for a woman on a show that has the word pretty in it. Sometimes I feel like I'm trying too hard, like I don't belong. Sometimes I felt like a fraud. The minute I'm off that stage, I try to get as me as possible. See, at her core, it bothers her that she's really trying to pretend to be something she's not. It's a full-time job to pretend to be something you're not. It's a full-time job. And for many of us, the Jewish leaders for sure, Jesus is pointing out, that's a full-time job. Do you ever feel that way? This is a full-time job, trying to project an image, trying to be somebody I'm really not. Because that's important. Jesus is addressing that very idea. Many of us in the church are pretending to be something we're actually not. And with celebrities in Christianity, we find this out eventually. Many of them eventually walk away because it was all a show. You probably know that Jesus grew up being a carpenter, helping his dad who was a carpenter. The word that's used to describe Jesus as a carpenter in Matthew 13, 55 is the word tecton. And it actually means a builder or a craftsman which in that day meant there was just as good a chance he worked with stone as he did with wood, but he was a builder. Chances are, in the little village they lived in, in Nazareth, there wasn't much work, so three miles down the road was a place called Sephoris. Sephoris was a bustling city that, uh, the, that Herod was putting new projects into all the time. One of those projects was a 4,000-seat theater. I'm just telling you, there are definitely good odds that Jesus and his dad worked on that theater. And was that what was behind Jesus using a word that he used 17 times that nobody else ever transferred into the realm of faith or religion? And the word in English is hypocrite. Hypocrite to the Greeks was an actor. 
someone pretending to be something they were not, putting up a different face depending on what role they were playing. Jesus may have seen that, may have watched that, may have watched actors and said that is the perfect example of what my father feels when we put on a false front, when we pretend to be something we're not. We claim to be living for God when in fact we are living for ourselves because we are the most important people in this world. Now as we can see, Jesus was referring to people who were actors in the realm of faith and religion. Now today, it's a little different. I, I don't know as many people who are trying to use religion to prop themselves up, maybe so, but I want to make a little transition into who we really are. I believe that we are consumed with being actors because of the culture we live in. And the first part of that is that we're addicted to entertainment, meaning we must be a part of entertainment. And I'm going to propose that entertainment and performance in life are very closely wed. When it comes to entertainment, what that means is I've got to be amused. You remember what the word amused means. A is not, muse is think. I don't want to have to think. And I really believe, if you've ever seen these man on the street interviews about things in our culture, about history especially, and you can tell people are not thinking a lot anymore. The average American adult checks his or her phone every six and a half minutes. The average teenager texts 100 times a day. 80% of teenagers sleep with their phone and 44% never unplug from their phone. College students who use any form of media are using usually four forms at one time. Studies show that frequent multitasking like that is associated with depression, social anxiety, and trouble reading human emotions. Have you seen any of that going on? The average American home has the TV on seven hours a day, and the average American watches TV four hours a day. Husbands and wives spend three or four times as much time watching TV as they spend talking together. Robert Putman was a uh, political scientist and he wrote about this. He wrote a book in the year 2000 entitled Bowling Alone, The Collapse and Revival of American Community. And it's his premise that people are no longer able to function in relationships because of this very thing that we must have technology as the central figure of our lives and we must be entertained. So Putman came to believe that this idea of technology becoming a focal point of our lives was now leading to serious health issues, issues of violence in our culture, other things. He put it this way, dependence on television for entertainment is not merely a significant predictor of civic disengagement. It is the single most consistent predictor that I have discovered. A major commitment to television viewing, such as most of us have, has come to be incompatible with a major commitment to community life. I would add, that was a few years ago, that not just television, but any media form that really takes a focal point in our lives, it is causing an unraveling of our society as we know it. Now, whether it's from a fear of missing out, that people just can't stay off their technology, or it's simply they're bored, that's debatable. But in Sherry Turkle's book, Reclaiming Conversation, she puts it this way, we are being silenced by our technologies. In a way, we're cured of talking. From the early days, I saw that the computers offer the illusion of companionship without the demands of friendship. And then, as programs got even better, the illusion of friendship without the demands of intimacy. You might remember Steve Jobs, who was the giant of technology, who passed away several years ago now. But I don't know if you know this, in his biography, it came to light that he did not allow his children to have technology in their possession, whether it be iPads, iPhones, whatever the case may be. Walter Isaacson wrote his biography, and here's what Isaacson wrote about Steve Jobs. Every evening, Steve made a point of having dinner at the big long table in their kitchen, discussing books and history and a variety of things. No one ever pulled out an iPad or computer. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? The one who really spearheads the idea that everybody needs this? Not my family, because I know how detrimental it can be 
to human beings and human connections. Eric Schmidt, who was uh, one of the co-chairmen of Google for a time, still maybe, I don't know, but he was going to, I believe it was Philadelphia, to do a conference, and when he walked in, the first thing he said when he stood up was, how many of you, while I'm lecturing, will be on your phones? And almost everybody in the place raised their hand, and his response was, good, that's what we want you to be doing. Isn't that a little scary? <laughs> that's the reality of how life has become so that we need to be entertained. And so entertainment and then performance will come along and it'll now become detrimental, not just to our relationships here, but maybe even, yes, our relationship with the Father. So the problem, you ask, and you may be thinking, what does this have to do with what Jesus said 2,000 years ago? The problem is, what happens if and when that mentality seeps into the church? And yes, I am suggesting it has. The church, I believe, has become about entertainment and performance, which is a very dangerous thing when you look at the words of Jesus in Matthew 6, 1. Several years ago, Pastor Chuck Swindoll, who is truly a man of integrity, uh, he put it this way, something within me recoils when I sense that the program in the church is choreographed, coil, choreographed. <laughs> <laughs> Something within me recoils when I sense that the program in the church is choreographed right down to the last 10 seconds, and I am an observer of a performance instead of a participant in worship. Faith is not a long series of performances. His concern is my concern, and I think it's a reality that in the modern church it's become about entertainment and performances in spite of the fact that Jesus says, be careful, grab hold of this idea, don't let this happen. So what's my premise? After 35 years in leadership in the local church, be it small or large, we've experienced both, I believe that whether it's professional and polished or clumsy and cheesy, it's become a show. When people ask me if I miss being in the local church, my answer, if I really think I can be honest with that person, they can handle it, I don't miss the show at all. That's a problem. Not that I don't miss the show, but that's what the reality of the local church. In other words, I have little doubt that Jesus' words of caution towards the people on that hill on the north side of the Sea of Galilee that day would not be the same words for us. Watch out. Take hold of this idea. Be very careful. I take you back one more time to Matthew 6, 1, this time in the New English Bible where it says, be careful not to make a show of your religion. Be careful not to let this influence how you do faith. And yet I think it probably has. So there's this addiction to entertainment that we have that I think is influencing how we live out our faith. And secondly, our propensity towards performance which starts when we're really young right when we're two years old mom dad watch this you know and it continues hey guys watch this to perform is enormous performance in our life is about us doing things that we think other people will approve of or enjoy and esteem us highly and we perform our whole lives many of us and sometimes it's through sports and music and acting and drama and through academia and all kinds of ways business but the bottom line is our whole lives can become a performance and we stuff our faith right into that same category and it's a real problem so again let me reiterate it's not just the cinema or the television it's our everyday involvement with technology and how it becomes such a big part of our lives Again, Sherry Turkle puts it this way, social media can inhibit inner dialogue, shifting our focus from reflection to self-presentation. Isn't that what Facebook is about? So many mediums are about my presentation to everybody, my performance for everyone. You may have heard of Henry Now, and he has since passed away, but he was uh, a guy who was a professor, uh, a Catholic priest, a professor at Notre Dame and other places like that. And he decided at one point to go into Toronto, Canada, and live there in a home with the mentally handicapped. 
and it was eye-opening and humbling for him. He said, these broken, wounded, and completely unpretentious people forced me to let go of my relevant self, the self that can do things, show things, prove things, build things, and force me to reclaim that unadorned self in which I am completely vulnerable, open to receive and give love regardless of any accomplishments. Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, 9, so we make it our goal to please him. That's what Nowen found out. I have lived a life of performance. And I, I realized when I got with these people that they didn't need my performance. They had no interest in my performance and it stripped him bare pretty much and brought him back to the reality of who God made him to be. So if you find yourself in that place where that one verse in Matthew 6 just resonates deeply with you. Stop putting on a show. What should we do? What's the so what? Let's get to that. Let's make it really practical. And I would suggest to you that the, the answer to this predicament, because we live in such an entertainment, amusement-oriented, performance-driven society that has seeped into the church, into our spiritual lives, without us even knowing it, we have a need for simplicity because that very thing that we've been describing is very complex, isn't it? Trying to put out an image for people so they don't know who you really are and trying to keep up your supposed love for God while in fact you really are in love with yourself. It's a very complex life that most of us are living. So we have a need for simplicity. So Henry David Thoreau was an author and an abolitionist during those years of President Lincoln. And he decided at one point he had had enough attention and he moved to a very simple cabin way up north. But he had this idea and he put in his cabin three chairs and each chair represented something to him. And I want to use his decision to do that as a metaphor for us. He would say that one chair represented solitude and the second chair represented friendships and the third chair represented society. And we're going to exchange community for society, but I want to use those three chair metaphor idea for what we need to talk about. The very first thing we need, if we really want to simplify our life, is to see the essential nature of solitude. Okay, we'll start with that chair. The chair of solitude. There's an actor and comedian by the name of Louis C.K. and he, he was talking about the idea of phones and how detrimental they have become to us. He said pretty much 100% of people driving are texting and they're killing each other with their cars. But people are willing to risk taking the life of others and ruining another because they don't want to be alone for a second. We so fear being alone. And you've seen this. Maybe you've done this. Stop at a stoplight. Oh, I, where's my phone? I need to, I've got time here. I don't want to be bored. I don't want to be alone. Paul Tillich put it this way, language has created the word loneliness to express the pain of being alone, and it has created the word solitude to express the glory of being alone. The problem is when they both come to mean the same. So when I speak of solitude, I'm not speaking of loneliness. I'm speaking of doing something on purpose so that you can learn how to be okay being alone, and you're not really alone. We know that, right? In solitude is where we connect so deeply with God. Mozart put it this way, when I am, as it were, completely myself, entirely alone, and of good cheer, say traveling in a carriage or walking after a good meal, or during the night when I cannot sleep, it is on such occasions that my ideas flow best and most abundantly. Thomas Mann put it simply, solitude gives birth to the original in us. Is that a great line? It gives birth to who we really are, who we were meant to be. And Picasso put it this way, without great solitude, no serious work is possible. Okay, Steve, so you got all these famous people. No, no, I'm not done. Listen to this. Before daybreak, the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray, Mark 1, 35. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, Luke chapter 6. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into a boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, Matthew chapter 14. Jesus practiced the discipline of solitude. 
Can you imagine how many people wanted to be around Jesus? At times he'd be up all night healing people, but he intentionally, purposefully set time aside to be alone with the Father. Are we doing that? That is gonna be essential. If we're ever gonna stop living this life of duplicity, where we pretend to be something we're not. So Thoreau's second chair was about friendship, all right? And friendship is really something that we are no longer very good at because I believe of our focus on technology. And again, you can read a lot about that in Turkle's book. Jesus, as we know, had three very close friends, Peter, James, and John, and he invited them into the most privileged moments of his life, I believe. He not only had the hordes of people around him, the multitudes, he had his disciples, which counted from 12 up to maybe 70, but within that he had three close friends. It is said that you and I may go through our whole lives and only have a handful of friends, and that's okay if you still know how to be a friend, if you still know how to listen, if you still know how to care about someone else above your own needs and desires. That's friendship. That's a part of how we will pull away from this distracted life because in friendship you will hear truth if they're really true friends. And then Thoreau's third chair was society. I'm going to call it community because we talk a lot about community. Scriptures talk a lot about community, being in uh, small fellowships. Okay, we're not talking being with a thousand people here. That I think that one chair for us represents maybe 10 to 20, 25 people. And within that group, we find people who have the same goals in life. Almost everyone I know loves the idea of community, but very few people are interested in the reality of community because community is difficult, it's challenging, and it makes us very uncomfortable. So if you're there where you love the idea, maybe it's time to move towards the reality that I will do life this way. You might remember David's sin of adultery and then murder. And it was during that time that God just couldn't seem to break through to him, so he sent Nathan. I want to suggest to you that Nathan the prophet was part of David's community. He wasn't his best friend, and he might not have even been amongst his closest friends, but he was in his community. He knew who he was, and Nathan held David accountable. And that's what community does. Community holds us accountable, and if there's anything we need now, it's accountability, especially in the context of what Jesus just said. As we said before, no couple stands at the altar and makes a lifelong commitment expecting to become distracted and to eventually drift apart from one another and break up their family. No mother or father invites a child into their home believing that someday they'll get too busy and they'll ignore that cute little child or get fed up with that cute little child. No businessman enters into the business world thinking that someday I'm going to become so fixated on success and wealth that I will cut corners and I will lie and cheat in order to continue in my lifestyle. No graduate from college ever believes they'll become so fixated on themselves that they'll lose all friendships and be doing life alone. No young couple, uh, a guy and a gal, get together and start dating believing that someday they will pressure each other into situations that will end with an unwanted child or with disease or even with suicide. Nobody starts out that way. We just drift into that. I don't believe you or I ever started into our relationship with Jesus thinking we would make a show of it. We drift into the performance because that's what our culture is all about. And so that's what our faith life, which is our life, that's what our walk with God becomes. It becomes a show for people to see while I actually am a whole different person. So you might be saying, Steve, this is really a negative message. <laughs> I'm not really digging this negativity. <laughs> I tell you, all I'm doing is teaching on chapter six, verse one, where Jesus says, get a hold of this, don't miss this. You're going to be tempted to make a show of your faith. I got to tell you, my father does not applaud that. He does not care for it. It's of no worth. It's of no use. And so I take you as we close to 1 Peter 4, 17. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. 
It is really easy to judge the culture in which we live because it is rotten to the core. And there are examples before us every day of its rottenness and fallenness. But Peter wrote, judgment begins here. Am I putting on a show? Am I not who I claim to be? John was born in Maryland in 1838 into a family of actors. And so John became an actor like his brother before him. And you probably know where I'm going with this, with the date, because it was in 1865, March 20th, I believe, when John, who was an actor, that was his life, but he was also very fed up with the idea of people in the South not being able to have slaves. The John I'm talking about, of course, is John Wilkes Booth, and he decided with some friends that on March 20th of 1865, they would kidnap President Lincoln. And if they kidnapped him and got rid of him, at least held him as a hostage, maybe, maybe they would change the direction that was going where the South could hold on to their slaves once again. But the kidnapping didn't happen. President Lincoln did not show up where and when he was supposed to. So just three weeks later, on April 14th, he got wind. Lincoln John would be showing up at Ford's Theater to watch a comedy with his wife. And so, as you know the story, he crept into the box, and at about 10 o'clock that night, even though the Lincolns had come in late, they were enjoying the show. It was a great show. It was a comedy. He took his 44 caliber and shot President Lincoln in the back of the head. President Lincoln and his wife were in the booth there with a guy by the name of Henry Rathbone. And when Booth shot President Lincoln in the head, Rathbone came towards him, he stabbed Rathbone, jumped out onto the stage, and he cried out, Six Semper Tyrannus, which means ever to the tyrants. It was the motto of the state of Virginia. Yes, the tyrants must go forward, is what he cried out. They carried President Lincoln's body across the street. If you've ever been there, they still have the bed there that he was lying in and family and friends, the vice president gathered around him. But the next morning at 7.22 a.m., he was pronounced dead. You talk about a showstopper. How ironic is that? We began with President Lincoln being the showstopper. You know, two-hour speech, it'll go on. No, he stopped it with two minutes of absolute sublime thought. And now the end of his life comes, and it stops not just a play in Ford's Theater, but it stops play of his life. But Jesus is the ultimate showstopper by what he said in Matthew 6, 1. There's an old frivolous and disrespectful question that's used sometimes. You may have heard it before referring to President Lincoln and his wife, but the question is to his wife. Besides that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? The point is, could anyone miss the point so badly? The point is, Matthew 6, 1, could we miss the point so badly? that we would live lives that are showy, that are based on performance. That is what Jesus says, get a hold of this. My father is not laughing or applauding. It's time you become real. Put a stop to the show. What a challenging passage. What a challenging thing to come out of the lips of Jesus. So my question today is this, why would we live a life that's a show, a performance, in the name of the ultimate showstopper, the one who said, God's not amused. Don't go down this path. No matter how showy our culture gets, we need to stay focused on pleasing the only one that matters. It's a great message, isn't it, from the lips of Jesus? I'm sure the people that day were kind of astonished and they must have known of what he was speaking. They saw it every day. Let's learn the message. Let's learn it well. Thanks for joining us.